Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Adam Posen, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back here and to welcome some new friends as well. Uh, it is, I am just now live tweeting that we are on. Um, today is a special day in the history of the Peterson Institute, but more importantly, much more importantly, I think an important day in the ongoing public debate about the next steps for U.S. trade policy. We're very proud to have with us today President Richard Trumka of the AFL-CIO. A bit more about him in a moment. But just to say that we all know that labor's voice should be heard in ethical terms and is heard in political terms repeatedly throughout the trade debates of the last 20 years from NAFTA onward. And on different sides of trade, there is a sense that on the labor side, they don't get listened to, and on some people pushing trade, that they get listened to too much. But what has been lacking, I think, is an amount of substantive engagement about what the professional labor movement in the U.S.'s views on trade substantively are, and an engagement with it from the people concerned about trade in a substantive rather than short-term political sense. And I'm very grateful to the AFL, to Damon and Thea, who are running policy studies at the AFL for suggesting and arranging this, and to President Trumka for joining us. In a context where it has become undeniable that labor share in the economy has gone down in recent years steadily, um, and not just in the US, but in other countries, it is fair to think about whether or not trade plays a role in that and how trade policy going forward can affect that. I personally believe, and I think a lot of work the Peterson Institute has done, suggests that the share of that blame, in a sense, for that development uh, due to trade is vastly exaggerated. But I think it remains important to confront the arguments that understandably arise in this context where working people's incomes have been under threat steadily in the US and in the advanced world and to engage on that. So we are very proud today to have with us President Trumka to speak about US trade policy and American workers finding the elusive win-win solution, which I think is a superb title. Um, I think all of you recognize Mr. Trumka. Rich, of course, has been president of the AFL-CIO since 2009. Prior to that, he served as secretary treasurer, a not altogether insignificant position at the AFL from 1995 to 2009. And prior to that, he spent 13 years as president of United Mine Workers. Um, and even prior to that, Rich was an attorney at the United Mine Workers at their Washington headquarters. So this is someone who has devoted their life to organized labor under the AFL banner in the US and could be the best possible person for us to start the substantive engagement rather than people just taking positions. And it's in that spirit I'm grateful to recognize Richard Trumka and ask him to our stage. Thank you, Adam, <clears throat> for those kind words. And I'd like to thank you uh, and the Peterson Institute for inviting me to speak today. I can tell you it's, uh, it's very good to be here. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about trade, all of us. And if you read the newspapers, it doesn't take long to pick up the battle lines and the main theories uh, and the talking points. But at the end of the day, the partisan battles are really just so much noise. For me, it, it all got to come back to one simple question. <clears throat> Is our trade policy working for America's workers and for our nation as a whole? And the simple answer to that question right now is no, it isn't. I don't think anybody can credibly argue that America's trade policies are working for American workers, uh, for our friends from the neighborhood, uh, for our kids, uh, or even for our hometowns. Nor do I think that the macroeconomic numbers support an argument that our trade policy is a success. Whether you look at the chronic current account deficits, 
our net international debt position, or the broader labor market data on wage stagnation and growing inequality. So I say it again, I simply don't believe that an argument can be credibly made that things as they are are working. Now, Jeb Bush, Florida's former governor and now a, a presidential hopeful, recently said that economic immobility and America's struggling middle class are the defining issues of our time. I truly hope he comes up with some solutions to those problems. Uh, you see, trade policy, is, as it's been pursued since NAFTA, and as it is conceived uh, in fast track and in existing drafts of the TPP, is a significant contributor to those problems. We all heard President Obama and his recent State of the Union a message when he said, we must make sure that everybody in our country has the tools to succeed. And we've also heard Pope Francis has made this his global mission to see that humanity is served by wealth, not ruled by it. See, these goals should be shared by all of us uh, when we talk about the next big step in our global economy. Now, I spend a lot of time talking to working people, people who elect me, the people who pay my salary, and a lot of others that aren't affiliated with unions. And the vast majority of them are far from Wall Street and they're far from Washington, D.C. These are people who've seen jobs go away and the numbers on pay stubs remain stubbornly flat or even fall. See, trade needs to work for all of us, every one of us. And that's why we need to have a real debate in America about what we're trying to do when we make trade deals. Because the right answer can never be the sole purview of corporate America. See, the question we should start with is, how can our trade deals help us reach our shared goals? Actually, maybe the first question that we ask ought to be, what should our goals be? What should be the goals of any trade agreement? And then measure those agreements by the goals that we come up with. But for more than 20 years now, we've looked at trade through the very narrow lens of corporate interests. In truth, our trade deals were not really trade deals. They were investment deals. Their goal was not to promote America's exports as much as it was to make it easier for global corporations to move capital offshore and ship good jobs back to America. And the logical outcome? was trade deficits and falling wages. And that's exactly what we got. Now's the time to adopt a, a broader lens that promotes a, a national conversation, not one that pushes trade as a corporate entitlement. You see, our trade deals must do more than increase next quarter returns on Wall Street. Our trade agreement should advance an economy that creates good jobs in America, which enable regular working people to succeed by working hard to get ahead. And the American labor movement has long said, and I dare say loud and clear, that good trade agreements must improve wages and working conditions for workers around the globe and not just here in the United States. We've insisted, and we will continue to insist, that has to be the yardstick that we used to measure trade deals by. See, we live, we shop, we work, and we play in a globalized economy. That's the way the world is. Yet that doesn't mean that working people are destined to suffer in that economy. Our trade agreement should advance all of the United States' interests and at the same time contribute to the overall development 
of the world economy and rising living standards for all. Now I'm asking you to visualize how trade policy can shape economic activity throughout global chain, uh, supply chains differently than it does today. Not by greasing the skids for a global race to the bottom, but by incentivizing and rewarding innovative innovation and by creating good jobs. See, that's how we can begin to shape the competitive strategies that we want to encourage here in the United States and among our trading partners. That's how trade policy can help to balance the world economy and stabilize global financial markets. And that's how we can lay the groundwork for working people to earn a fair share of the value that we create, rather than simply lining the pockets of a tiny global elite while setting our financial system up for future crisis. Today, <clears throat> as we discuss fast track, as well as Trans-Pacific Partnership, we can focus on the issues of what is in our national interest and how our trade policies can advance it. Now, I'll spell out my positions on these two important questions, and in doing so, I'll make the case against passing fast track for TPP. First, the goal of our trade policies for the United should be for the United States and the people who live here to have a fair chance to compete for investments and jobs in the world economy. Our goal should be a, a world economy that's structured around a virtuous cycle of broad-based rising incomes and rising living standards rather than a vicious cycle of falling incomes and financial instability. Some of what I'm saying is uh, going to sound pointed. Because you see, working people have been pretty badly burned by existing trade deals. Our basic problem is that much of the trade debate is actually a debate about whether we should debate trade policy or just accept what's handed down by unaccountable group of people. That's plain wrong. You see, every single thing in our trade deals should be openly discussed and subject to pu public oversight and the full legislative process. There should be no question about that. Think about this. Every piece of legislation that affects your working lives is debated, it can be amended, it can be changed, everybody gets a chance to comment on it, except the one thing that affects your working lives more than anything else, and that's a trade deal. This one will affect 40% of the world's GDP, 40%. And if you add TTIP in it, it's 60%. And yet we shouldn't be able to know what's being voted on, amend it, and actually change it for the better. See, because of that, fast track is wrong. And it's undemocratic. And I got to tell you, it's a rotten process. And the American labor movement intends to kill it. Bill Clinton didn't get fast track authority. And he went on to do a lot of good trade deals after NAFTA. The same thing can happen here. Because if the American people understood all the devices in these deals that can be used to fight policies to make our food and our workplaces safe, to keep our air and our water clean, and even just provide simple labels for consumers, they'd be up in arms. See, I am 100% confident that the average person doesn't want American trade law to give global corporations the most 
favorable possible investment returns while threatening our democratic decision-making institutions and feeding global economic imbalances. I don't think that'll sell. And I can tell you, we in the labor movement aren't buying it. Democracy should be the way that we decide. People should be able to, made to accept more trade policies, should not be made to accept more trade policies negotiated in secret by corporate interests that destroy jobs, exert downward pressure on American living standards, cause us to run accelerating current account deficits, place us in a vulnerable financial position, and contribute to the imbalances that led to the economic crisis that began in 2007. And that's how it's been for 30 years. And the evidence on the table. And the verdict is clear. Trade policy has not worked for working people, nor for our country as a whole. And it's time to change and then move forward. See, Washington's old corporate approach to trade policy is directly contrary to our overall national policy objectives, especially in areas of profound strategic importance to the United States, such as Central and South America and East Asia. That is because our trade policy has been designed to suppress wage growth in these economies and to stunt the development of governments capable of regulating their own economies and labor markets in their own national interests. So where does TPP stand in my estimation? Well, first of all, it's hard to say because nobody that I know has seen the whole thing. Well, let me do a survey. Anybody here seen all of TPP agreements so far? Raise your hand. Okay, we're all on the same page that way. I find that problematic in and of itself, quite frankly. But what I am aware of tells me this. It simply isn't a high standards agreement in relationship to either TPP member countries or to China. And it is especially poorly conceived regarding key areas that'll have strategic importance to the United States in a multipolar 21st century. And let me break it down. <clears throat> the public portions of TPP include no meaningful language addressing currency manipulation, and no language addressing how member countries commit to reducing carbon emissions. In the critical area of labor rights, there's no reason to believe that TPP's labor rights provisions will ensure that workers in all 12 TPP countries will be able to organize and bargain for a fair share of the wealth that they produce. The labor framework of prior trade agreements has been wholly ineffective at dealing with labor rights violations in small countries like Guatemala, and Honduras. And while the May 10th agreement between President Bush and House Democrats was a significant step forward, even this advance has been unable to address the serious labor rights violations in Colombia, even in the context of a U.S. administration committed to labor rights enforcement. See, according to press accounts and the USTR statements, one thing TPP does include is the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. Now, ISDS is just a fancy way to give corporations a special legal system that circumvents democratically accountable laws and courts. ISDS allows corporations to directly challenge almost any law 
or any regulation based on an ill-defined concept such as fair and equitable treatment. In contrast, all provisions for enforcing labor rights in TPP require action by member governments. Neither workers nor unions can enforce the labor rights provision on their own, even by suing in national courts. Now, I'm not just talking theory here. In the first three years of the labor action plan in Colombia, 73 trade unionists were murdered for trying to organize workers. Now, these men and women were just like you and I. They were killed for trying to exercise their rights under the law and speak in a collective voice. Now, that's terrible. It's absolutely tragic. And yet these trade deals do nothing to address this injustice. And the U.S. government has taken no official trade action in response to those 73 murders. Anyone with a lick of common sense can tell you that not only are these killings a, a human right catastrophe, they're driving down wages and workplace standards in Colombia and every country that trades with Colombia. But here's the thing. Unlike the clunky labor provisions, which require workers to wait for government action, the ISDS provisions can be used immediately by multinational firms to challenge efforts by TPP member countries. See, ISDS tilts the playing field away from democracy, from workers and consumers, and toward big business and multinational investors. Now, sometimes we're told that TPP's key objective is to allow U.S. firms to keep control of global supply chains. We're told that'll benefit us here in America. Well, forgive me if I pour a little cold water on those claims, because no one has able to been able to explain to me how an agreement that seems focused on helping U.S. companies use their control over supply chains to move work to low-wage countries will help the United States and the people who live and who work here. Frankly, after what happened with NAFTA and China, PNTR and the Korean Trade Agreement, I really don't understand how anyone can make those same arguments with a straight face. See, the TPP, as described by the USTR, just isn't consistent with the promises being made about how it will solve our problems with China and elsewhere. If anything, TPP gives China improved access to our market through weak rules of origin, undermines existing understandings with China in areas of carbon emissions, and paves the way for China to in, uh, enjoy the full benefits of TPP without addressing its use of currency policies to subsidize its exports. Quite frankly, TPP would be a step backward, not forward. But it's not too late to address these problems. For example, ISDS could be deleted from the trade deal. Scratch. It's gone. Almost everybody outside of the United States would be delighted to see it go. So happy, in fact, that they might agree to strong language on currency manipulation in exchange for getting rid of it. Making those two changes would 
be really popular here in the United States, quite frankly, on both sides of the aisle, they would be popular. And while negotiators are at it, they could fix the holes that have allowed Honduras labor right cases to languish for three years and the Guatemala case to languish for six. They could fix the weak rules of origin that China will exploit to its benefit. They could add in provisions to address climate change and rebalance the pro-Wall Street tilt in the financial services, procurement, and food safety chapters. And then we can talk about it being a step forward instead of a step back. Now, I know there are a bunch of you in this room right now are thinking, oh, that crazy Trumpka. That, that labor movement, they're just opposed to every trade agreement. Well, let me tell you this. We're opposed to every bad trade agreement. We're not opposed to trade or trade agreements. We're opposed to every bad trade agreement. And we've seen a bunch of them. Bad provisions like ISDS continue to have, uh, have life only because they remain largely unknown, hidden in the dark. In the sunlight, they'll vanish. I'm sure of it. And that's why Congress should reject fast track. And how many more ugly, unpopular, undemocratic provisions will be locked in by fast track? Well, I don't know. None of us do. And that's why fast track is so destructive. But if fast track is rejected, what should be the nuts and bolts of a new trade deal? Well, our trade policy should have the explicit goal of eliminating our trade deficit and restoring the U.S. to trade balance. Our greatest priority in trade negotiations should be to create a level playing field for the people who live in America to compete, not to create special deals for corporations that happen to be incorporated here. And in tandem with the principle that our government should help provide help to companies based on whether they are creating good jobs in the United States and not whether they happen to be incorporated in the United States. Now that should be the test for import-export financing, for tax policy, and most of all for the entire discussions about framing our trade policy. Special Legislative procedures like fast track should be used only when Congress has complete confidence that our government is pursuing the right policies. And after this country's experience with corporate-dominated trade policies, the millions of lost jobs, the massive structural trade uh, deficits, decades of falling wages, Neither Congress nor the American people have that kind of confidence in those who lead our trade policy. You see, it's time to change the paradigm. It's time for us to move forward as a nation. Now, we have an agenda in the American labor movement. We call it raising wages. We're working on it at every level and in every corner of the country. We support fast food workers in the fight for $15 an hour. We support Walmart workers who recently fought for and won a raise. Not enough of a raise, but Walmart workers show that the way to raise wages is for workers to stand up in a collective voice and fight for that increase. And this year, five million of my members. Five million will be negotiating for higher wages, better benefits, and safer working conditions. The wages of working people have basically not gone up a dime 
since 1997. From then until now, all the gains from increased productivity, not some, not most, but all, have gone to the people who need it the least. Now we know that our trade policy is a critical part of the structure of our economy. A structure that is either about raising wages or about pushing wages down. So we need a trade policy that supports raising wages, just like we need to invest in 21st century infrastructure and education and a skilled workforce to raise the minimum wage, to reform our labor laws, to ensure our tax policies are consistent with supporting good jobs and raising wages, and to deliver full employment by ensuring that our macroeconomic policy doesn't cut off recovery before it occurs. We know that raising wages will be good for our families, for local businesses, for our communities, and for America as a whole. And we're going to lay the groundwork for raising wages by rejecting fast track, and if it isn't fixed, by rejecting the TPP. And then we'll pursue a productive, balanced trade deal in the Pacific. Now we know that we can only accomplish this by welcoming and engaging in a vigorous and open debate over trade. And that, my friends, is how we will find the elusive win-win trade agreement. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, President Trumpka. Um, Adam, you can call me Rich. Okay. <laughs> In fact, I'm trying, I, pre I'm trying, I prefer I'm it. <laughs> you can call me Adam. Um, Rich, I want to make sure, I think you were loud and clear, but I want to make sure I got right what I think is one of the core, if not the core message of your talk. In your view, it's not trade itself or even trade with particular companies that's bad for American work, uh, particular countries that's bad for American workers. It is the structure of trade deals and the absence or inclusion of protections in them. Yeah. Is that right? That, that's absolutely correct. You know, there, there's two theories, I guess, on trade. Uh, one theory is that total free market trade, let it happen, no matter what will happen, the market will correct it. And that's what we've had over the last 30 years. And there's another theory of trade that says the rules really do matter. And bad rules are rules that are designed to drive down wages or prevent people from having a collective voice are, are bad and they've had a bad effect on us. We think that a high standards agreement can be arrived at and we should arrive at it, but we need to start thinking differently. We need to start talking with one another. And actually, as I said at the beginning, probably set the goals of a trade agreement first. What should be the goals? I mean, if the goals are for, for American business to succeed, trades worked. If the goals are to help every American raise the standard of living, create jobs in this country, support the middle class, then trade's been a colossal failure. Let me push you a bit on that point. Sure. Um, you know, various times in your speech, you made reference to trade deficits, to wage declines, decline of good jobs. It is a fact that, to take two notable examples, in Germany and Japan, you also had countries that ran sustained large trade surpluses. Um, and in those two countries over a couple decades, wages have also declined for most workers. What you said very articulately at the end, 
the fruits of productivity went to the corporates, not to the workers. That's certainly true in Germany, not in, as well. And as Robert Lawrence, who's with us today, put out in a book that we published last year, the decline in manufacturing jobs has been roughly the same in Germany and Japan as in the US. So why do you make this link that, I'm not saying these are good trends, I'm not saying these are wonderful things, but why do you make this link that it's trade deficits in the US that are doing this when the countries that some people accuse of cheating in the international trade are suffering the same thing? Well, China's not cheat, not uh, suffering the same thing. True. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing real well at it. It's called because of currency manipulation. If you look at all, all of the literature out there, mm -hmm. it's not the only cause, and I never said it was the only cause, but it's part of the structural reasons. The rules of trade that we've agreed to over the last 30 years have been designed to hollow out the American co country and to lower wages. That's the exact result of what's happened. And you can't deny that. Well, Part of it is because of that. You can't deny that currency manipulation has cost us millions and millions of jobs. That's because of the trade deal. They couldn't do that without permanent PNTR. If they had to do PNTR every year, it would be a different deal. You can't deny that it's had some effect, you know, a substantial effect. That's the link that we make. It is designed, in our opinion, to hollow out the American economy and drive down wages. Well, let me, again, I'm a little, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm halfway with you and halfway not. <laughs> the halfway I'm with you is, well, there are policies that have been out there hollowing out the American economy, um, but I'm not sure that they're the trade policies. I mean, you listed at the end, you know, since Ronald Reagan broke PACCO, uh, you see union membership and union strike activity just fall off a cliff, long before NAFTA, long before China PNTR. The union movement gets harmed by the uh, full-on attack on collective bargaining. We have a tax code yeah. that is totally skewed towards capital away from labor. It's interesting to me, you're obviously fighting on these issues as well, but it's interesting to me that you're emphasizing that trade is a major factor. Well, here's what happens, Adam. We go to the bargaining table uh, right, after Pat, right after NAFTA, and an employer says to us, take a wage cut, or we're moving your job to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And they did. We've lost 60,000 factories since 2000. But so did the Germans and the Japanese. Uh, the, Germans, the Germans haven't lost that yes, many. Yes, they back. have, actually. No, they okay. started from a higher level, we, but they we, lost we, just as many. They lost to Poland, they lost to the They Malaysia, lost some they lost jobs, but not the same extent, and their standard of living didn't fall the way ours has fallen. Because, because they have a they better were, tax system. Well, they had a different safety net that we don't have in this country. Agreed. Agreed. And that safety net helped people transition. We don't have that in this country. Completely agreed. But you have to say, and even you would have to, and I know you are a dyed-in-the-wool free trader. If I cut you open, little NAFTA balls would fall out. You know? They'd, be, you, NAFTA, they'd you, be NAFTA balls, but they'd also be taxed the rich balls. So they're two yeah. colors. Yeah. That'd be NAFTA balls and CAFTA balls and Korea balls. I, I know that. But, but even those little CAFTA balls that fell out would say that currency manipulation is bad. Currency manipulation is bad. It's enabled by this. ISDS isn't good. You think ISDS is good? Yeah, actually I do, but that's another <laughs> argument. Um, at the currency manipulation thing we can get into, but I really think actually what you just said before my balls came out was, was um, much more important. I'm not going there. <laughs> hey, you took me there, Rich. I'm just getting down with you, man. Um, the thing that you said before that, which I think was much more important, frankly, is the point that we don't have the welfare state that most other rich countries do. And I think that is shameful and is real. And so one thing, for example, you don't mention in your, in your speech is trade adjustment assurance. I know some of that, trade as adjustment assistance, I know some of that you call burial insurance. And I frankly don't love it because it's targeted only at some workers and not at all workers. But why isn't the response to trade, or let me rephrase it. Is part of the reason you all go after trade as much as you do because you know you can't deliver a stronger welfare state given the state of American politics. I mean, if you, are you taking trade hostage no. to get that stuff? No, okay. we go after trade because it's been bad for American workers for 30 years. 
You know, every one of the, the metrics that I gave you, that I set out here, you can't dispute. They're the facts. No, but that, the facts if, are it happened if, in other countries If a six well. trillion dollar cumulative debtness, uh, indebtedness over those periods is a good thing for the country, six trillion, uh, then, then it's, a, it's successful. I don't think it's been successful. I don't think six trillion is good. I don't think a half, 500 billion a year in trade deficits is good. I don't think the wage suppression is good. I don't think the loss of health care, pension benefits, sick days to, to workers is good. I don't think that 900,000 plus African American workers who got laid off because of trade and are tied, tied to it, uh, and went from wages of $45,000 a year to $35,000 a year and lost $10.2 billion over that period of time is good for this country. And, you and do, and I don't. No, I don't. What I think is... Well, that's the result of what you, no, what free trade... No, no, actually it's not, but you're, it's your day, so we'll let you pretend. Um, <laughs> one last question, if I can, could. Can I pretend that you really aren't a free trader? You can pretend anything you like, my friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> However, the facts will out about where job loss comes in an economy of 160 million workers, of whom 5 million either lose or change their jobs every, every month. You know, so talking about these numbers and that you can assign those to trade and you can assign those to currency manipulation. Well, look, when you, when you think, I can look you, at the you, steel you can, you industry. Can that, look, false I can look at the steel industry and say China's cheating. They're pumping steel pipes into here, and U.S. workers lost their jobs. I can tie it to that. And I can do can that. Do I can do that in industry after industry. We can do it in tires. We can do it in textiles. We can do it in glass. We can do it in autos. We can do that. You can do that in some of those industries, which is why we have some. Which is why that's we've the backbone of America. No, it's not actually. Oh, it isn't. No, what is? Actually, trade that, is right. No. No. The American okay, people, good. We agree on that. No, no. Trades no, are not the no, backbone no. of America. The backbone of American industry is not the fetishization of particular manufacturing jobs at a particular time. And it certainly isn't textile workers. The idea that rich American people should be textile workers in today's day and age is really a strange one, and that's not China. That's we can't pay people, anybody, enough to be a textile worker and make it work. But let's go on. Say what? What do you, you think? You can't pay people enough to be a textile worker? You really think you really think you got a competitive textile industry in the US? That's not what you said. You said we can't pay people enough and still have them be textile workers. You know, they're not making enough, that's true. But it's the rules that were set up that causes us, to, an American textile worker, to, if TPP's passed, to compete against a Vietnamese textile worker who gets 65 cents an hour. Now, what do you think is going to be the result of that? A textile worker in this country making $10 an hour will get eliminated, and a textile worker in Vietnam will get increased, paying 65 cents an hour, there'll be another one. Now, is that good or bad for the world economy? It's actually good. It's good. Okay. It's actually we good. We totally the US disagree on that. Correct. <laughs> if you want, you keep accusing me of things. If you want to be the man who wants to see a significant portion of the 21st century American economy be textiles, God love you. Oh, come on. So that's, when, that's the nicest sleight of hand I've ever seen. No, that's exactly what you just did to me You didn't have, you you didn't just have did an argument, and now you want to make it about textiles. I, just I use that as an example. It's a it, What example. about steel? You think we should make steel, aluminum, copper, any of those? Maybe, should we? Maybe, maybe not. Should we make automobiles? Maybe, maybe not. Oh, we shouldn't make automobiles. Okay, maybe. I got you. I don't have a fetish but on But we should industry. all be park rangers, and one week I'll be the park ranger, and you be the... You be the tourist, and the next week you be the tourist, and I'll be the park ranger. Yeah. That'll work. That's a great economy. It is, if you have the right tax code and welfare state. That's what Europe's been living on quite nicely. Um, give so give it to me. Well, I'll, I'll consider it. So look, <laughs> let me get shut up and open it up to questions from the floor. I find that impossible. Hey, man, <laughs> I'm just down in the balls with you. What can I do? The gentleman there, if you go to the back, anyone who cares to speak, if you'd identify yourself, and ask a question. We have a standing mic in back. We have a roving mic with Jessica in front, and I'll recognize you. Please. Uh, I'm Sam Gilston with Washington Tariff and Trade Litter. Um, one of the things I struggle with as a journalist uh, covering speeches is trying to reconcile speeches and facts and statistics. And I was wondering if you could comment on 
Um, even though the number of manufacturing jobs have declined by about 5 million since 1994, the total number of jobs in the U.S. has gone up by over 30 million. Now, most of those are uh, service jobs, obviously. Uh, at the same time, in the last 30 years, uh, the number of people in the world who have rise, risen to the middle class has been hundreds of millions, and the number of people who are in poverty have declined by a billion. And the number of workers in the steel industry have declined by from 300,000 to 100,000 or less, but the product, production of steel in the United States is still at the same level it was around 1982. So why don't service workers count as working people that you care about, and how is the race to the bottom in a world where middle class and poverty is middle class is rising and poverty is declining? How is that a race to the bottom for most of the world? First of all, I don't necessarily agree with all of your stats uh, because I would find some dispute there. But we do care about people at the bottom. That what we don't want to do and what we don't think is good is when you exchange a $25 an hour job for a minimum wage job. Or when an African American in a community gets laid off at 45000 and goes to 35000 We don't think that's good. Yeah, he got a job, but he's ten. $10,000 a year less that he can't consume, that he can't spend. It's a spiral downward. Do we want to make those minimum wage jobs good? Yeah, because you know what? When coal mining jobs first came around in this country, they weren't good jobs. Steel jobs weren't good jobs. Auto workers weren't good jobs. Because workers could get together and bargain collectively, they made them into good jobs. Good middle class producing jobs because they had a collective voice and they were able to capture much of the wealth or a fair share of the wealth that they produce. What you have in this country now is an avalanche against the right, to, right to, of people to be able to organize uh, a raft of anti-worker laws, uh, passing them, taking away collective bargaining rights from employees and those at the bottom those low-wage jobs, we work with them every day. The day laborers are part of the AFL-CIO. Home care workers are part of the AFL-CIO. Uh, a number of the taxi cab drivers are part of the AFL-CIO. And we're trying to raise those wages up. But with the, the climate, the environment, and corporate America's outlook since Ronald Reagan said that it's OK and it's a good thing to bust unions, it's been difficult to raise those jobs up. And these type of trade deals increase the power of corporations and decrease the power of workers, which makes it more difficult to raise those jobs up. These trade deals should not increase the power of corporate America and decrease the power of workers. It should do both so that we can both benefit equally from a trade agreement. That's, that's what we strive for. To be able to have a trade agreement where it actually benefits everybody in society, not a very thin layer at the very top. Thank you. The person at the back who keeps raising your hand, go stand at the mic and I'll recognize you. First, the gentleman that was yeah, there. Thank you. Uh, Jim Burry from Washington Trade Daily. Just a very pragmatic uh, question, I guess. Um, you said you were against uh, TPA. Are you going to be able to defeat it or do you need uh, some allies uh, in that battle? Well, we always need allies. Uh, and uh, in fact, we put together uh, the biggest coalition uh, against TPA that uh, we've ever had. For the first time ever, every union in the United States is opposed to TPA. You know, that's the first time we may have all been together on any issue. Uh, <laughs> even when Taft-Hartley was passed, I don't think all of us uh, were against it. Some people said, oh, it won't be so bad. We can't find them anymore, but I think there were a couple of them. Uh, but so we're all, we're all against it. We're also civil rights groups, community groups, church groups, uh, and a number of others uh, are working with us in coalition uh, to defeat it because it's bad. It's undemocratic. Look, this is the most important piece of legislation that's going to affect your working life. Every other piece of legislation that affects your working life Every constituency group gets to come out and say, here's how this affects me. It's good, it's bad. Farmers get to come out. Manufacturers get to come out. Employers, high tech, low tech. Everybody gets to come out, and then your representatives get to amend it. 
except for the piece of legislation that affects your lives the most, and that's this trade deal. Now, TPP says, or TPA, I'm sorry, TPA says that Congress will list these bargaining objectives, and then the, the administration will go and negotiate them. And then they'll come back when they certify that they've been met, and you get an up or down vote, no amendments. Now think about that with regard to TPP. Hasn't been passed, objectives hasn't been set, and TPP is almost nearly negotiated. They've already said, the administration's already said, we met all your objectives, even though they haven't been set. It's a true joke. It makes a parody out of even fast track. So what we're saying is, you ought to be able, if, if this agreement meets the needs of the American people, it will get passed. Several have in the past. They've gotten passed in the past without fast track. This one will too. And if it doesn't, that means it didn't meet the needs of the American people. And quite frankly, it should not get passed if it doesn't. Okay, the gentleman over there, please, Jessica. That's you, wouldn't, that's you. Um, and then the lady at the back, and then Fred Bergstein. Thank you, Adam, and, and thank you, President Trumpka, for, for coming and speaking so clearly. Um, my name is Sean Donnelly from the U.S. Council for International Business. Um, I guess I'm just trying to understand, and I think it's maybe related to what Adam was asking, the difference between sort of coincidence and causality. It seems to be your analysis is that every lost job, every dollar in trade deficit uh, is attributable to trade and doesn't seem to take account of productivity changes, technology changes, global competitiveness changes, currency changes, all those kinds of things. I mean, do you have the the rigorous analytical things to, to, to prove what I think was your message, that everything that's bad that's happened is due to trade over the I, last I 25 years. Okay. I never said every, everything bad is because of trade. I said it's a significant part of the structure that causes these things to happen, and it is. Other things have contributed as well. And yes, there's analytics out the wazoo that will show you that trade, in fact, is a significant part of it. There, the, any study you can find will say that currency manipulation has caused the loss of millions of jobs. Currency manipulation occurs because of, the, of our trade deals. You could stop it otherwise. If you, had a, you could do a border adjustment tax that could stop China from doing some of the things. We could do it with pollution. That's another problem with TPP. It doesn't have anything on the environment in it, and it'll allow that Should one I'm sympathetic with. Good, I, I appreciate that. We ought to stick on that one then, huh? Why don't you answer his question? No, no. no. <laughs> no that one I'm with him. <laughs> on all of it? No, no, most of it. No, oh, okay. No, I didn't say it's all of it. I said it's a structural part of it, and there's, there is a lot of analytics that will show that trade, in fact, the trade policies we have, not trade, the trade agreements that we have have caused significant job loss and the lowering of wages. Thank you. Lady at the mic. I have a very simple question. I'm Jutta Hennig from Inside US Trade. This is all too sophisticated. Uh, uh, my question is uh, specifically in your intent to defeat the fast track. You've frozen the uh, contributions to individual candidates. Um, you have formed a coalition. Have you spoken to the president recently about this issue, and what is your sense of the situation in, in Congress? Where does it stand now? And will dusting off the also tried and true national security argument, does it have a chance of pulling this out once again? Uh, there's a lot of questions rolled into that simple question of yours. Uh, first of all, with uh, regard to the PACs, we haven't shut our PACs off to individuals. We've shut our PACs down and we're diverting the money that we would have given to political entities or people to fight fast track so that we can actually do the things that we need to do to, to defeat it, to go into districts, 
to talk directly to constituents in, the, in districts uh, and do everything that we can to make sure that people understand the dangers and how undemocratic uh, that fast track is. Uh, yeah, they'll trot out the old national security, one for the Gipper, we need to have this or else uh, China will make all the rules and uh, all of that nonsense that has no, really, no validity when you analyze it uh, either way. They won't have anything to say about currency manipulation. Uh, they will say it's impossible to do. You can't do it. Now, if you believe that, I have oceanfront property in southwestern Pennsylvania that I'm <laughs> dying to sell you. Uh, we've already done it. We've already done it. The International Monetary Fund has a large chapter on currency manipulation that the United States not only agreed to, they insisted upon. That chapter could very easily be slipped into a trade agreement and you could deal with currency uh, manipulation and make this agreement a whole lot more uh, fair and saner and more productive for the American people. Uh, the ISDS is a, is a real problem. Uh, they, they say that, uh, yeah, we just have to have it because uh, we have to have it. Uh, they don't say why there should be a special tribunal uh, for, for corporate investment rights that nobody else can avail themselves to. No individual, no person, no union, no government. Only corporations can do that. A tribunal that has three attorneys that sit on it that rotate. I decide your case and you decide my case and everybody's happy about it. Case in, uh, one case in, uh, in Canada was a really great one. Uh, it was uh, Mobile and Murphy Oil versus Canada. Uh, and the two oil companies challenged guidelines issued by the Canada Newfoundland Offshore Petroleum Board. The guidelines required the companies to support uh, local economic development through expenditures on provincial research development and training programs. Uh, and the guidelines, all they did was update existing obligations. Well, Canada lost. The companies first went into the courts of Canada and they lost. So they went to this special tribunal, this ISDS, and they won. And they got uh, a big judgment uh, out of it. Nobody else, no other government, no other person could get a second bite at the apple. But this sets up where you get a second bite at the apple, but only, only for corporations. We think that's unreasonable and unfair. I want to pause there for a second and go back to something you just said on currency. Um, without getting into the numbers for the moment, you said something which I think is very important. Uh, you referenced the role of the IMF in dealing with currency disputes. And I think a lot of people, I'm not speaking now just for myself, I think, I think a lot of people who have been opposed to unilateral interventions by the US on the currency manipulation, but would be very comfortable if we could get to a scheme where the IMF was putting it on China. Now obviously, it's a little disingenuous because the IMF response to its shareholders and all. Well, the IMF, they, any, any individual can stop it from happening, right. which is what happened. No, no, no. but, but I, think, I think it is interesting to at least think about the idea that pushing for a good international regime in a positive sense is one way around this. And it's interesting that you raise that. It's also, just, just to be fair to our friends in the administration, at least some of them they're not going to tell you what they said, that it's impossible to do anything about currency manipulation. What at least my understanding is what they would say, which you can, I'll give you a chance to dispute in one second. But my understanding of what they would say is, diplomacy works better than tying our hands with rules. If you look, China really was screwing us in 2004, roughly, when they had a 10% trade surplus and were really intervening massively. And we've done steady diplomacy since then, and they've stopped intervening for the most part since then, and it's come down, and that hasn't screwed up other things. So trust us to do the diplomacy. Yeah, we trust them. 
We've trusted them for 30 years. Okay, no, that's fine. I want to hear your reply to that. Well, so okay. Well, look, look. Actually, I was hoping I could still get no, an No, you don't get any more questions. Thank you very much. I, that was part of my initial question was, that's what's fine. the situation so, in Congress? Then you'll be glad that he's responding. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for that democratic gesture. We're not, we're not democratic <laughs> here. This is right fast there. track here. I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> This is, this is about professional negotiation. <laughs> so, sorry. So, I was saying the, the administration wouldn't necessarily say that it's impossible to do anything about, about exchange they did. trades. It's that they successfully pursued a diplomatic thing that made no. a difference. How do you well, that, respond that, to that? That's not what they said to me. But that's, that's not what, what they've they said, said to the Congress. That's not what they said to people on the Hill. They said you can't do it because when we intervene, uh, in, in when, when the Federal Reserve does quantitative easing, that could be considered currency manipulation, which is total malarkey. I mean, it, it, look, currency manipulation is when countries buy large amounts of foreign assets over long periods to prevent the appreciation of their exchange rate despite running a, a current deficit, and we ain't done that. Mm -hmm. We also have the definition, a very clear definition in the IMF, which we've agreed to, which we've assisted on, which could be put into uh, a trade agreement. And, but they've told me we can't do it because they'll attack us on quantitative easing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's, that's nonsense because you can do it. It's very simple to do it. In fact, we're already doing it, although in a very, very ineffective way because the IMF, IMF can be stalled by any of the countries within it. Uh, the second thing, the geopolitical argument they make is we have to do this so that China doesn't set the rules. And yet they give China all the good and none of the bad in TPP. China and every one of the countries in TPP will still be able to manipulate their currency. China has signed an agreement with us on, on carbon emissions. China will be able to use these other countries to foil that agreement. They'll be able to use the weak rules of origin to pump their products straight through the other countries back to us, and they will still be setting the rules. If this is about stopping them from setting the rules, then we really ought to make it about the rules that we need. And look, here's the other argument they made. Well, it's better than the status quo. Well, first of all, that's the wrong question. But I don't think it is better than the status quo. I think it sets us backwards. But remember this. The question shouldn't be whether it's better than the status quo now. The question ought to be, since these rules are enduring, what will it do for the country and the economy 10 years from now or 15 years from now? Is it capable? of giving us a fair deal then? And the answer, in our opinion, is it doesn't give us a fair deal now. It surely won't give us a fair deal then. And it will do nothing to curb China's control uh, over that area. Uh, Fred Bergs. Um, Rich, you have very eloquently laid out a series of objections to key elements of the TPP negotiations. They're now going on. Trade agreements past and present. And I support you, as you know, on most of those. But you did not address what I've always regarded as the heart of our trade agreements. And what I continue to think is a powerful argument in favor of the TPP. I think there are two incontrovertible facts, but I want to see if you agree with them. One, trade barriers in the countries we're negotiating with are a lot higher than they are here. And second, that our trade barriers, as a result of all these past deals, are actually quite low. Now, if you accept those two facts, then you should want, I think, to pursue the basic objective of all free trade agreements, namely, to get rid of barriers on both sides. If you agree with those two facts that I've enunciated, you're bound to conclude the US is a big winner from eliminating the barriers on both sides. And second, it can't hurt our working 
people, our employment levels, our wage levels very much because our barriers are already so low. Well, here, here's what so, you... So just to say, I'm with you on fixing up a lot of the rules issues, certainly the currency issue, that you talk about. But the heart of any past or I think proposed trade agreement is really stacked in favor of the United States and particularly the U.S. working people because of these asymmetries that exist and the results of the past. Tell me if you could agree with those facts, well, I think are facts, and the implications that I'm drawing from them. First of all, you forgot to add one thing. They need our market a whole lot more than we need their market, and our leverage is access to our market. Now, if we've already given that away because our barriers are so low, our barriers can be raised tomorrow without a trade agreement. We could raise them to neutralize that if that were fair or if that were the right thing to do. We could do that, but we don't. So the question becomes, if you, give, if you don't want to give your leverage away, then we ought to make the rules right the first time. That's what we're talking about. We don't oppose trade. We don't oppose trade agreements. What we oppose are bad trade agreements and bad rules or agreements that are investment agreements that masquerade as trade agreements. Do we want to increase our ability, our exports? Yes. Do we want to do it so that we have a $500 billion deficit year after year? The answer is no. It's not sustainable. We can't do that. Yet that's what the rules that have been negotiated to date do. And TPP will perpetuate them on a bigger scale. 40% of the world's GDP will be encompassed in TPP, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Again, I'm, I'm with you on most of those rule changes, but I think it's because we have the greater leverage, like you said, because of our market being so much bigger, they do need us more than we in some sense. That's why we can say to them, eliminate your tariffs and non-tariff barriers, which average 10, 15, 20 percent, we'll only get rid of our remaining barriers, which average two. That's an asymmetrical bargain in favor of the United States. Why can we, with a straight face, put that on the table? For exactly the reason you said. We've got a lot of leverage, and the other countries basically agree with it. To me, that's a win-win for the United States. I, I, if that's all the trade agreement did, would sure take a good look at that. But that's not what the trade agreements do. They don't create a level playing field. They create a field for investment to do well and workers to do not so well. And ISDS is a classic example of that. Workers' rights go through the clunky old system. We have to insist that the government take a case. Colombia, years in the making. Guatemala, six years in the making. All of those things because we didn't have the right to go for it. So it's all about the rules. We look at trade, Fred, not from the free market. Trade will be good no matter what, and the market will straighten itself out. Because this isn't the free market. These are all about rules that alter the free market. And they create winners and losers. And to date, America's losers have been America's workers. America's winners have been Wall Street and the investing class. What we want to do is say, let's create a set of rules that works for the little guy as well as the big guy and really does help the country. Let's realign the interests of America with corporate America because there's a great divergence right now. They pursue their interests even if it's to the detriment of our country. We want them to be realigned. And we can use trade as the, as the vehicle that we should be able to do that with. Can I, I, I need to interject because my colleague Fred took us down a path that actually is in some sense misleading. I need to interject three economic facts. The first is the gains from TPP actually mostly accrue to Japan and Vietnam and Malaysia because their barriers hurt their people and their economies. And so in the study Peter Petri did for us, you can talk all this crap about leverage, but the bottom line is it's actually the gains 
go to them, not at the U.S. expense, but because they're getting rid of the protected interests in their economies and they gain. And you put it in Merkel's terms, and that's wrong. I put it from a U.S. perspective. Second, the main point of economic theory, and this is why I disagree somewhat with Rich about textiles or even steel, the main gains from trade are about the dynamic pressures it puts on to reallocate capital and labor to newer industries. Now, we can talk about the safety net. But it's only a fiction for the U.S. Congress that trade is about jobs. Trade is about productivity. The third about what? Productivity. The third point. Well, we've, we've lost there as well. Well, that's, that's a fair point. And that's, that's where you got to put And that's where I think you have some real arguments. The third thing, just to say, in terms of paralleling exactly what Rich said about the rules, about thinking 15 years out, you can say, and this may be, this may, not saying this is what the Obama administration says. But thinking about the rules 15 years out, the point of TPP is they may need our markets now, but over the next 15 years, all the growth is going to come in their markets, not in the rich country market. And so again, that doesn't take anything away from your point that we need to set the rules that serve US interests. That's fine. But don't leave it as in the static view that, oh, we got all the thing, and we're doing them a favor by letting them in. The idea is I, I to capture their markets for the next 15 I, I don't, years. I don't say we're doing them a favor letting them in. I don't know that we're doing ourselves a favor by, by letting them in with the agreements that we've had. What we ought to be doing is looking for a way that workers on both sides of the border end up benefiting from these trade agreements and not just the investor class on both sides of the border. Because that's what's happened over the last 30 years. The investor class has benefited on both sides of the border mm -hmm. and not the workers on either side of the border. I mean. Look at any country down south. Uh, workers are worse off than they've been. There's downward pressure on wages. There's, uh, you know, Vietnam's a, in a special class all by itself. But, but Colombia, I mean, this is a, an administration that you would have to say is worker friendly. Oh, okay. And, and yet, they've done nothing under the work plan under these rules. Nothing. And you had 73 trade unionists die. Those trade unionists pushed down wages. The work plan that they've agreed to says they should have corrected that. And they haven't. So it's not only the rules that we ultimately agree on, it's the enforcement mechanism for the rules that ultimately get agreed on. So you need fair rules and you need an enforcement mechanism. And you can't leave it to just the governments themselves, and you can't have a special class of privilege for corporations and not the people that pay the tab for that. That's why ISDS is such a corrosive, bad provision and should be eliminated. Gentleman at the back, then this gentleman, then the next person um, at the mic. Two, uh, two very specific questions. Bob Davis with the Wall Street Journal. If I understood you right, you said you were shutting down your PACs and diverting money into the fight over fast track. How much would you expect that those, those many unions that you were talking about, how much would you expect they'll spend in the fast track fight, recognizing that the- You mean us? Yeah. I don't have any idea. I mean, the corporate- I know you guys always want to figure, if I say $6 or $16, the, the, the article tomorrow will be $16. It'll be nothing about trade and the debate over trade. I don't have any idea. We'll spend what it takes, everything we can do, everything we can afford to spend, to try to defeat it because we'll it's be bad, to, we'll undemocratic, to, and unpatriotic. Will you be able to match the corporate uh, spending, which is bound to be in the millions? Never. <laughs> Never be able to match corporate spending. Never. But what we do have, we start off with 80-some percent of the American public already agreeing with our point of view, or I should say us agreeing with what 80-some percent of the Americans believe, that fast track is undemocratic, bad, and it's not resulted in good agreements and shouldn't be here. And one, other, one other question. In the past, uh, one of the strengths of the anti-trade um, deal uh, coalition has been a, co a true coalition between right and left. Um, with the greater partisanship in Washington now, uh, my understanding is that that's much more difficult. You talked about uh, a lot of alliances among unions, which is clearly you know, important on the left, but as I understand, there's much, much less kind of coordination between right and left. Do you think that's the case, and is that a weakness as you go into this fight? 
I, I think there's probably, I don't know that there's ever been great coordination between the left and the right, uh, at least not, not my recollection. <laughs> uh, but I, I would say that there's a, a large segment of people across all the political spectrum, Democrats, Republicans, independent, progressive, liberals, conservative, ultra conservatives, uh, born again Christians, you name it, uh, that think that fast track has been bad. And I think they, they exhibit that. And I think that we'll come together, maybe not in a formal coalition, but that sentiment comes together and will exert tremendous pressure on elected officials from both sides of the spectrum to, to, to defeat fast track because it's been bad and the American people knows it's been bad for the country. Uh, the gentleman over here, please. Uh, yes, uh, my name's Adam B. Sudi. I'm with Politico. I don't know where he's at. Oh, I'm right it's here. Politico. Sorry, he's um, over there on the right. I had two, two quick questions. Left, yeah, yeah. Uh, stage right. <laughs> um, it, the first is on, on um, your TPA fight um, and, and your adm admission that you can't outpace c corporate spending in this fight. I mean, is the, when you look at TPA and, and most likely a fight against TPP at some point, what other leverage does labor, does organized labor have uh, in this fight with lawmakers, with votes? Um, what, are, what other areas, strategies are you considering? Um, and then on TPP, in your speech, you, you admit that this administration is committed to labor rights enforcement. And I'm just wondering how that jives with you know, what you were talking about with Honduras and-, and Yeah, uh, and they're, they're, well, they are committed to it, but the rules are so bad, they don't do it. They can't get around to do it. There's no way to enforce it. That's why you need better rules. That's why we need the rules to be able to do what corporations do. Corporation doesn't like a regulation that's passed. They go to court and lose. They get to go to their secret tribunal, get a second bite at it. Give me that. Let us have labor rights where CWA and the Teamsters and I sit on a panel and we decide the case. And then the next case, they get to decide. Now, we'll take that process, you know? And, yeah, but that's what corporate America has right now, the same process. What was the first part of your question? What, LSD? Have I been on LSD? <laughs> no, no, the drafters have been on LSD. You want LSD? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. I think the guys that drafted it were on the first thing. What was that? I guess the, the first question was what, you know, what other leverage do you think labor, organized labor has in, in, in the fight against trade? And then on that second the question, truth. a follow up. I mean, truth in sunlight. Is there anything in TPP that would, um, that would make you think there is some sort of mechanism that would allow labor to initiate disputes? Uh, what well, there, there is none in TPP that would allow labor or workers or anybody else except corporations to initiate disputes. Everything else is government initiated for every other right, environmental right, labor rights, everything else is government, which is slower than molasses in Alaska in January during a cold spell. Uh, that's how long it takes. The, 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 what we have, I think, is one, the vast majority of the American public has felt the, the pain uh, of trade deals that haven't worked for them and haven't worked for the country. So they are against it, against TP, against fast track, 80 some percent probably uh, uh, against right now. Uh, we have the ability to educate them and that's what we're doing. We're educating our members, we're educating the general public, we're educating our progressive partners, uh, and we're coalescing together. And sunlight uh, is the great cure for a lot of this stuff, because if the American public knew what was in a lot of these agreements, they'd be more angry than they are now. They'd be more against trade uh, than they are now or ever have been, because they don't know that corporations can go to court and lose and then go back and get a second bite at an apple from a secret tribunal that they sit on, that they create, they sit on. So our, our view is educate air antiseptic sunlight, let people know and debate it, and then we'll see what, what happens. Today, Rich has been very generous on letting the sun shine in in our place, and I hope he feels that we've allowed him to shine his light a bit. Um, I'm going to take two last questions in the back, but I'm going to just take the two questions in a row if I could, and then let Rich get the final word. Uh, so, Steve. 
Hi, I'm Steve Sylvie. I teach at American University. And the question I have is a little different. It's based on the fact that the UAW has made getting a works council a centerpiece of its organizing drive in Chattanooga and that Secretary of Labor Tom Perez has been talking favorably about works councils lately. So my questions are, do you know of any other AFL-CIO affiliates who are considering using works councils as part of an organizing drive? And the second part is, are you uh, going to approach Secretary Perez and talk about the idea of works councils for the U.S.? Fascinating. And um, Claude Barfield, AEI. I also get off the, the subject we've been on. I wonder if, you, do you make any, I know it's early days and we don't know what, how the negotiations will go, but do you make any distinction between the TPP on the one hand and the proposed U.S.-European free trade agreement on the other? That's a group of nations that have a wage structure closer to ours and welfare states that are at least equal to ours and most of them. How are you, as you go into the thinking about it, how, do you make any distinctions or is it pretty much the same thing? No, I, uh, well, first of all, we went into TPP with high hopes. I'll get to TTIP in a second. We went into T, uh, TPP with high hopes. We submitted a couple of hundred suggested changes to, to the trade representative with language, saying, you know, make some of these, majority of these, and we can get an agreement that actually works for us. And I think maybe four or five, maybe six, have actually made their way to the table. So unless you have a different way of negotiating than I do, if you don't put it on a table, chances are you won't get it. Uh, and these haven't made it to the table yet, so we don't think they're going to get there. The T TTIP, uh, you know, we've already met with the European labor movements. And what we've come up with is a, a set of principles. Those set of principles say you preserve uh, the uh, social safety net, you preserve workers' rights, you preserve works councils, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, you preserve works councils, these principles, and we'll, we'll go with it. Actually, I think they're probably in more danger uh, in those negotiations than we are. Because the worst result that could happen uh, in those negotiations in TTIP would be for us to suck jobs out of Europe and as a result drop their social safety net. Then we get the worst of both worlds. Uh, instead of everybody prospering, everybody goes down. Uh, that would be a tragic and we're gonna make sure, we're gonna work to hope that that doesn't happen. But I think just starting from scratch, TTIP has the best chance uh, of succeeding because of the relative equalness of the standards uh, of living in both countries, uh, the cultures are, are, are intermingled and, and very much the same in a lot of ways. So there, there's a good chance that it could succeed. And I wish, quite frankly, uh, that it had come first because then it could have been a model uh, for, for TTIP, I mean TPP, uh, to be patterned after, which would have made life for everyone a, a whole lot better. Uh, with the works councils, uh, you know, look, we really are interested in the war. I don't know where you went to. He, oh, he, he stands at oh. the mic. He stands down. Oh. Uh, we really do. Uh, we are really looking at the works councils. I already have talked to Secretary of Labor Perez about works councils. Look, here, here's what we think. You know, in this country, too many corporations look at workers as a cost to be cut, not an asset to be invested in. With works councils, you look at people as another asset, and so you invest in them. Moreover, if you really invest workers, you not only get their backs and their hands, you get their mind and their spirit, which is pretty creative. And when you get that combination, you really do become far, far, far more competitive in any economy, including the global economy. And that's what we seek to do. We think that uh, works councils have a, a great potential to have management and, and, and workers, their employees, come together in joint problem solving, in joint product development, in joint planning, and, and all of those things. So they use our head and our heart, not just our back and our hands. So we're looking very seriously at them. Uh, we think they have great potential. Um, several other affiliates beyond the auto workers 
are actually looking at works councils. Uh, and and not, not even in connection with organizing drives, but as a better way to do business and a better way and a better relationship. We think that if we can get that to happen, where we come together with management uh, in, in that kind of a process, I don't think there's anybody that can beat us. I don't think anybody can beat us uh, because I have so much faith in the creativity and the ingenuity uh, of the American worker. And uh, we're going we're gonna to work hard at that. And we're going to try other stuff too. And if, you know, if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. But the goal is to try to take us out of the us and them and get us into an overlay. We're actually both looking at things together and we're looking outward rather than inward at each other. That you don't look at me as a cost to be cut. Now, you, you have to understand this. In, in too many corporations right now, would, if they had a magic wand and say, you flick it and your union will go away, they'd have broken wrists. <laughs> they'd be flicking that thing so hard. And it's hard to create a, a relationship where you, where you work together when you know the person that you're working with really wants to put a wooden stake in your heart. So we've got to get past that hurdle. And co-determination is a great vehicle to get both of us past that hurdle. And that's why we're looking at it and other things as well. And we're pretty excited about it. This is a good note to end on. I'm just going to say two things, three things quickly, none of which disputing Rich. <laughs> um, first is on this note about companies investing in their workers and not just treating them as something the flick of the wrist. We will be holding an event here on April 6th talking about the wage increase initiatives that Aetna and Walmart and others have done. We can debate, for example, in the case of Walmart, how much that was an initiative versus bargaining pushing them either way. But we are going to have a panel, including Justin Wolfers and Jake Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute, talking about the productivity gains from giving low-wage workers a raise and a lunch and talk from Mark Bertolini, the Aetna CEO, who initiated that for his company. Uh, a second point, just more broadly, uh, is to thank Rich and to thank Thea Lee and Damon Silvers from the policy side at the AFL-CIO for coming to us and working with us to make this event. Rich certainly demonstrated not just knowing his brief and being able to wrestle with us, which never was in doubt, but his commitment to sunshine. There are clearly some issues on statistics and things where we would disagree. Uh, I leave it, I think our working people and some of the AFL's working people, we can have those debates in more detail. But this is where I want to conclude. I'm grateful to have the leader, the largest coalition of unions in the US, leader of the American labor movement, come out, engage, and make a substantive case, whether or not I agree with it, make a substantive case that has to be confronted that it's not about being against trade, it's not even about being against trade with poor countries, it's about poor agreements. And that is a basis for true debate and engagement, yeah. and I'm grateful to Rich Trumka for doing that. Adam, let me just uh, reciprocate and say uh, thanks for the opportunity, because I, I really believe that there's no problem that's insolvable if we won, we start from the same basis. We don't have our own facts. I mean, you can have your own opinions, but we ought to get to a basic set of facts at some point. And then we ought to set us some goals and work towards them. Uh, our goal ultimately, as you, you mentioned, your April 6th event, is to relink productivity with wages exactly. uh, because they've been delinked. And when that happened, uh, the worst of all worlds occurred in, in, in the country. So we really look forward to that debate. And, and this event, I think, is an event that should occur in a thousand different places across the country so that we can actually come to a conclusion and say, here's where you are, here's where I am, here's how we come together, and here's how we both can win, because that's the ultimate goal. I'd love to send a bunch of our fellows out there to do that with you and your team. Thank you so much. You Richard bet. Trump. Thanks for having me. Appreciate that. Thank you, buddy.